Good evening. Hello, everybody. Um, I would like to warmly welcome uh, you all to this evening's lecture uh, here at the ISEC uh, Populäre Kulturen. Um, I'm saying this both to the people in the room and um, also to a few people joining us online. Uh, my name is Moritz Ege. I'm the co-organizer of a sort of mini series of four lectures during this semester, which is embedded in the um, departmental series of talks and events. Um, the other co-organizer of this mini series is my colleague uh, Olga Reznikova, who's sitting there, uh, who will be moderating and introducing the third and fourth talks in this series. Um, she is, I have to say, the, the, the network node and the brain behind um, much of this. Um, now, uh, primarily, I'm very excited to introduce today's speaker, uh, Vasil Cerepani. Um, before I do that um, uh, a bit more uh, extensively, um, I'd like to say a few words about this program, about this mini series, and I'll take about 15 minutes uh, to do so. So what is this series about? Um, why are we hosting it? What are we hoping to accomplish here? Can you hear me, hear me okay back there? Yeah, thank you. Um, so very briefly put by inviting these three speakers from Ukraine and one colleague from Zurich as well, uh, we hope to gain insights into what is currently going on, to look under the surface of the war coverage, and we want to have an opportunity to learn about how Ukrainian colleagues uh, who work on intersection of culture, society, and, and politics contextualize and understand the current situation in an I discussed this uh, in intro talk with uh, Olga um, earlier this afternoon, and, I said, and, and I'd originally written uh, how our colleagues make sense of the situation. And Olga said, there's really no way of making sense of the situation, which I think is a, uh, a opposite um, remark here. So situation, of course, uh, also is a euphemism. Um, this is about a war of aggression, about death and destruction on a mass scale. Um, and about the Russian attempt to destroy Ukraine as a country, um, as a state, and also as an identity. I think that underlining this is important uh, to the speakers here, um, and also the insistence that this war did not begin in uh, 2022, this year, but in 2014. Um, but most Western Europeans um, chose to ignore um, or downplay what was going on. Um, it may, at, at first sight, perhaps see, seem a bit flippant or, or cynical to approach these matters through a cultural prism and through attention to the everyday. Um, but I think it is also clear that culture broadly understood is a crucial category here in a number of ways. Um, perhaps most importantly, culture serves as a legitimation for this war, especially through um, Russian propaganda's, propaganda's idea um, of a so-called Russian world and its ideology of civilizational autonomy and supremacy. Culture also serves as a, a discursive resource for the Ukrainian side, especially the claim of belonging to a European democratic culture, which in itself is a category full of contradictions and inconsistencies, um, but a practically useful one at this juncture. We're also witnessing struggles over cultural memory and meanings um, as justifications and denunciations of the war make recourse to the Holodomor, to the Second World War, to Stalinism, to fascism, to the Holocaust. Furthermore, the relevance of languages um, and their connections to identities, hybrid identities, and seemingly clear-cut ones um, seems also um, almost obvious. Also, culture in a different sense, in a sense of norms and patterns of social interactions, um, is omnipresent in current discussions about the war's development as well. We hear a lot, um, for example, uh, about resilience and self-organization in Ukrainian civil society and also about the apparently more networked and more flexible organization of Ukraine's armed forces, as opposed to a post-Soviet culture of hierarchical command and control. Ukrainian optimists say that these cultural differences will help them overcome the attacker. Implicitly and explicitly then, cultural claims um, permeate this war. As we're particularly concerned with uh, popular culture here, I should also mention that this war is mediated not only through news, but also through online popular culture, um, especially for people abroad, um, where there's an extremely online element to the ways in which many of us try to keep up with what is going on. 
people have different habits um, in that respect. Also, of course, of blocking all of this out. Um, but we also have the opportunity of constantly checking online networks for new information about the front lines. And if we choose to pay attention, or if we choose to be drawn into this or let, our, let ourselves be drawn into this, we can see a flood of short videos of artillery strikes and exploding tanks where dead bodies are often redacted and sometimes not, where military units present their accomplishments accompanied by um, pop music and embedded in video game aesthetics. Offline and online communities as well buy military equipment, vehicles, and even expensive drones through crowdfunding. The Ukrainian side has more international support there, but Russians are also using tactics of affective and networked mobilization and civil society like that. Now, where to start with all of this? Um, what Olga and I thought about in putting together the, the series was not so much about the specific approach of our discipline, the cultural or ethnographic lens, but at least equally as much the broader question, what are we actually doing when we're doing intellectual work at this moment in time? And to what ends are we doing this? Um, what is our responsibility as academics working at a university in that context? Um, and what are our priorities? Also, what concepts help us to understand um, the current horrors and their cultural and ideological roots? It should probably be noted that um, Ukraine and Eastern Europe more broadly are generally not core fields of the work um, at this department. It's a different situation here, for example, from the Slavic Studies Department, um, which currently also hosts a very interesting online lecture series, the Ring for Lesung on Tuesday evenings, if you're interested and haven't heard about it yet, um, check it out. It's about uh, documenting the war uh, on Tuesday evenings. So, of course, these disciplinary backgrounds are important. Knowledge of historical uh, contexts of, of, of language um, are indispensable. So on the one hand, many of us are sort of structurally out of our depth here. Um, on the other hand, we do bring a, few, bring a few things to the table, I think, partly through the focus on culture that I mentioned, but also equally importantly, because empirische Kulturwissenschaft can also be understood as European ethnology. Our core concerns as a discipline include questions such as how Europe and the European are being made and unmade, how Europe is constituted as an imaginary entity, as an institutional entity, and as an experiential entity, by whom and at what price. So perspectives like these can hopefully contribute to a better sense of what is happening. Um, the current situation, the violence, and also the fears, I think, um, permeate and confuse our roles as researchers and as private persons as well. And they pose challenges to which people working in universities have responded in quite different ways um, that I want to mention now. Uh, first is solidarity. Um, the university has taken on a number of Ukrainian students here, for example. There's support for colleagues who have been displaced. Some people collect money for aid, perhaps for weapons as well. And there are also countless symbolic declarations of solidarity, which may amount to powerful moral support overall, or they may not. Um, declarations of solidarity can quickly turn into empty gestures if they are not followed by actions. But on the other hand, few of us are ready to accept the consequences of actions that we may nevertheless feel are morally demanded. And at the same time, I think it's important to stress, um, even if academic work is connected to politics uh, inevitably and even to activism and practices of support can be powerful and transformative, that does not mean that they are the primary characteristic of the university. There are other important tasks too, of course. Um, they include, for example, documentation, which I think is a major issue here. Many colleagues inside and outside of educational institutions are working on documenting Russian war crimes, examining mass graves on the ground and on satellite images, trying to establish connections and accountability. This is a big topic in, in Ukraine currently um, that uh, Vasil and colleagues are, are working on as well, and we'll, I think, maybe hear about. A third aspect, a third task for academic work, um, I think very familiar to people in cultural studies, could be representational critique. In the context of this war, too, it is important to take a closer look, um, to reflect on what perspectives are being um, privileged and are being excluded from dominant discourses, how power works on that level. At the same time, sort of this deconstructive criticality also creates a certain unease at this point, at least for many people. Some of the standard conceptual tools and approaches of critical analysis seem strangely out of place at the situation. Um, a deconstruct deconstructive discursive criticism, for instance, 
could focus on processes of othering, um, how stereotypical images of the enemy are being produced and constructed. This is familiar territory for cultural studies. And surely there is a lot of that going on. For example, while Russians keep destroying Ukraine and killing Ukrainians and legitimating this with dehumanizing language and imagery, supporters of Ukraine also create stereotypical representations of these attackers and their country, describing them as orcs, for example, another pop cultural um, reference, which in turn sort of implies that Ukraine is the Shire, the Auenland in, in Lord of the Rings. But again, what to make of that? Is it worth spending one's critical energy on pointing this out, more or less triumphantly showing the problematic nature of such terms? Doing so, um, I think, would seem especially short-sighted in a context where the term Russophobia is used relentlessly by Russian propaganda in order to sell military aggression as a form of anti-racist self-defense against Western and Ukrainian Russophobia. So from how I phrased this question, whether I think it's worth spending one's critical energy on pointing out things like that, um, you'll have guessed that my answer to my own question would be, no, it's not really a good priority, even if, of course, it can be part of a broader analysis. But it is also our responsibility to bear in mind ideological recontextualizations of such critique and to not only deconstruct, but to situate and contextualize such forms of othering and how they function and who uses them for what. Um, a fourth task in this list is what I would call cultural political analysis. Uh, we call this series um, Studying Everyday at li Life at War, starting from Alltags Kulturwissenschaft. At the same time, we're not expecting here detailed empirical studies of how everyday life itself has changed and is changing. This seems like a difficult task at this point, perhaps also not the most important one. Rather, our colleagues will share their contextualizations and their analyses of this conjunctural moment and their perspectives on what it means to do intellectual work now under these circumstances. This may not be the usual sort of discursive mode of empirical cultural studies, but it is a crucial one, especially now. Thinking about and creating useful concepts, doing analysis in this mode can also perhaps be a form of solidarity. So I'll uh, soon be done with my um, remarks and this introduction. Um, I'll give a brief outline of the talks. Um, but I wanted to make one last detour, um, which actually concerns the ground here on which we're standing or sitting, um, actually. This office building here in uh, Erlikon is part of a post-industrial development um, built on the grounds of the former Maschinenfabrik Erlikon and Erlikon Bühle, um, the weapons factory that supplied guns and cannons, especially anti-aircraft and anti-tank cannons. Um, to many countries uh, in the 1940s, very much to Nazi Germany and the Achsenmächte, um, and in the 60s to countries leading wars and civil wars, including apartheid South Africa and Nigeria during the Biafra War. To many people, the export of these cannons and munitions stand for the destructiveness of the military and military industrial complex, the hypocrisy of humanitarian capitalist rhetoric, and the neutrality that is at times primarily pro forma. Um, so this is a central focus of historical memory, memory I would say, um, in this country, as in the recent scandals around the Bühle Art Collection um, in the Kunsthaus Zürich. At the same time, um, the cannons that were or originally developed by Erlikon Bühle are currently being used by Ukrainian armed forces um, as part of the Gepard anti-aircraft tanks. Um, they reportedly played an important role in the recent Ukrainian liberation of, Uk of Russian-occupied areas in the Kharkiv region. And Ukraine demands more weapons like this to repel the Russian attacks um, and the new mobilizations going on now. So I don't have a really deep point to make here, um, other than wanting to illustrate how this war is confusing political orientations for many of us, and also some of the meanings that we associate with our um, proximate surroundings, um, even in a place like this. So um, now a few more concrete words on the next sessions in this series. Um, in three weeks, which will be the next um, meeting, uh, next talk in the Ukraine series, um, we'll, we'll, we will welcome a colleague from the Slavic Studies Department, um, Silvia Zasse, and she will talk about a specific kind of TV show. Her talk is titled Disinforma Disinfotainment, How Russian Fake News Shows Report the War or Don't. Uh, it will be in German. She will take a look on how reality is being constructed um, on the Russian side and how epistemic strategies are used to create consent and complicity as well. 
The week after that, on the 26th of October, uh, we will be joined by Maria Majerczuk from uh, Lviv University. Uh, she's currently staying at Greifswald. Her talk is titled Difficult T Affinities at the War-Torn Buffer Periphery. Starting with the geopolitical notion of the buffer periphery and the question of col coloniality and decoloniality, she will, as she writes, explore possibilities and limitations for cross-border queer feminist solidarity and a critique of militarism proposing new solidarities against war and empires. Uh, the fourth and last talk in the series will be on the, just a little bit later, uh, seven weeks after that, on December 14th, um, held online uh, by Anatoly Podolsky from the Ukrainian Center for Holocaust Studies in Kiev. This titled Holocaust Memory in Modern Ukraine, How Can We Speak About Holocaust History After February 24th? His time, so I think this um, question has a lot of implications. Uh, it implies a lot of many difficulties, and I think we'll learn about these difficulties in the talk. It is everything but everything but easy to speak about the history of the Holocaust in Ukraine now, as some memorial sites have been attacked um, by Russian troops, who are at the same time using the history of anti-Semitism in Ukraine to paint themselves as liberators. So much for the uh, series of talk, uh, talks. Let me now finally turn to this evening speaker, um, Dr. Vasil Cherepanin. Uh, he's currently the director of the Visual Cultural Research Center in Kiev, uh, which he co-founded, and also the co-organizer of the Kiev Biennial Art and Architecture Exhibit, which has been going on since 2015. He studied cultural studies, um, Kulturologie, at the National University, University Kiev Mohila Academy Kiev, uh, where he also received his doctorate and then began teaching mostly courses on cultural theory, um, also art history and contemporary art. The Visual Culture Research Center, where he is now, where he is now primarily based, is not a university institution, but an NGO, a non-governmental organization that serves as a platform for collaborations between um, academics, activists, political activists, uh, and especially artists. It's an in internationally very well-renowned and well-connected institution. Um, Vasil is also very well-renowned and well-connected, has lectured and collaborated all over Europe and beyond, and continues to write and edit, edit academic um, publications, curate exhibits, symposia and other programs. Um, if you want to have a look at the websites of the Visual Cultural Research Center and the Kiev Biennial, it will give you a brief introduction to this work. So we're very grateful and happy that you made the journey from Kiev to Zurich and then we'll travel uh, around a bit, given the events in Ukraine and also um, in and around Kiev this spring, saying that we are happy that you're here has a deeper meaning than usual. To the Zoom audience, uh, let me just briefly say that the chat will be opened up for the presentation for the discussion and uh, Laila Gutknecht uh, will moderate the chat. Uh, thank you, Laila, for that. So thank you for coming. We're looking forward to your presentation. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Thanks so much uh, for this uh, indeed profound and uh, kind presentation, Moritz. And uh, first of all, I would like to express my very deep thankfulness for uh, for having me here and especially to Olga Reznikova and to Moritz Ege and the rest of the team. Uh, I'm really very honored uh, to be here and to open up the lecture series uh, that you will be part of perhaps uh, throughout the rest of the year. Um, but also politically speaking, I perceive this uh, invitation as indeed a solidarity gesture that we uh, very much uh, need uh, at the moment. And uh, so thank you so much uh, really for that and uh, to our online audience as well as uh, uh, you. I'm really thankful that you decided to spend this rainy evening uh, with, uh, with us. So thanks so much for coming. Uh, but before I start, uh, the talk, which is titled Culture at War, Ukrainian Revolution, Russian Fascism and European Decolonization, I also would like to express uh, my thankfulness to the Ukrainian military, uh, without which I wouldn't be simply able to, uh, to be here, and without which um, my country wouldn't exist, at least in the form that it does at the, at the moment. And uh, in general, I also think that without the Ukrainian resistance, uh, 
um, people outside Ukraine, especially in the EU and also in those parts of Europe which are not part of the Union, uh, would be today perhaps busy with totally different agenda. Uh, discussing, for instance, uh, what what is to be done with uh, Kishinev People's Republic, with Bialystok People's Republic, or Narva People's Republic, discussing this new sham referenda in absolutely different territories than than in uh, in Ukraine. So I also perceive this, uh, to be honest, as a kind of a political task of mine. Uh, to speak um, to speak up um, uh, today, because um, my country is experiencing uh, uh, very harsh uh, circumstances. Uh, all these words, uh, like from the 19th, 20th century, like annexations, occupations, deportations, filtration camps. There are filtration camps <laughs> in the 21st century, right, in the center of Europe. Uh, so it's exactly the kind of constant awareness of these uh, harsh realities on the ground that uh, that allows me to uh, to speak uh, to you on the matter today, uh, because uh, I'm trying somehow to follow and to, to keep some kind of fidelity to the truth. Uh, and uh, that is again my political task uh, to deliver on uh, on on that. Uh, also, because uh, I perceive myself here uh, as a kind of a substitute, because uh, I live uh, um, during the last half a year a kind of a borrowed life, which was granted to me by my fellow uh, compatriots, uh, which I keep in the front line. Uh, and at the same time, you here, uh, you uh, you are having a borrowed time, right? Which is being bought on the everyday basis uh, by the Ukrainians who are again keeping the the front line. Uh, and actually, uh, I mean, as we are in Switzerland, as I'm in Switzerland, uh, I was just thinking that uh, it's uh, more than eight million people in Ukraine that uh, have been displaced in the recent months. Uh, because of the uh, war atrocities, which is more or less the the uh, the whole population of this uh, country, right? Uh, just to have this kind of perspective. So what I'm going to do uh, in the next uh, 45 minutes or so uh, is uh, actually to stick exactly to uh, to the title itself. Um, and we'll try to elaborate on these uh, three uh, notions which are mentioned in the title Revolution in Ukraine, Fascism in Russia and uh, Decolonization in Europe, because in my view, uh, I basically think that uh, these uh, concepts uh, form altogether a kind of a system of coordinates, um, which define both uh, so they define both the ongoing war and the war developments, and at the same time, uh, the modus operandi of contemporary cultural field in Ukraine, uh, which means that I will be basically trying to do both, uh, analyze the current war through the lens of the uh, contemporary or modern cultural uh, field uh, in Ukraine from an institutional standpoint, uh, because basically these uh, concepts are uh, being on the everyday basis tackled by Ukrainian cultural practitioners, as uh, somehow Moritz already mentioned, as well as depict shortly the specificity of Ukrainian uh, contemporary culture uh, in the context of this, uh, um, of this war. But before I start doing that, let me just um, make... Um, a very important point uh, on the nature of this war, since uh, till now many in Europe uh, still uh, behave and pretend uh, as if this war is uh, somebody else's war, right? And uh, pretty often, uh, as we hear it in, in the media, that this war is being referred to as a Ukraine war or war in Ukraine or Russian-Ukrainian war. Uh, some, sometimes it's, it's been called uh, as a war of aggression or war of attrition uh, or total war, this totaler Krieg, right? Uh, not by occasion, this uh, concept is very, historical concept is very recognizable, right? Uh, 
not accidentally. Mm, whereas we, what we are dealing with is actually a full scale uh, European continental war with, uh, with regards to the recent decades uh, with unprecedented scale and, uh, and magnitude, right? Like just only consider the territories that, that are involved in this war. Ukraine, of course, itself, uh, Russia, Belarus, which has been annexed by the so-called Russian Federation uh, before. Uh, also Transistria, which is actually the occupied, Russia's occupied part of Moldova. Also Syria, by the way, right? Because uh, Syrian mercenaries appear to be fighting on the Russian side in this war. Also, we have actually three seas which are involved in already in this uh, war the Black Sea region, the Caspian Sea, and the Baltic Sea. Uh, as for the Black Sea, it's obviously not just Crimean Peninsula, right, uh, occupied by Russia in 2014, but it's also about uh, such countries as Turkey, Romania, Moldova again, Bulgaria, right? Baltic states, as we know, have been directly threatened from the Belarusian territory by the Russian military, right? And uh, also, apart from that, we have Scandinavian countries, uh, Finland, Sweden, which, because of the, these developments, have joined the NATO military alliance. Right? Uh, on the other hand, we have more than 50 countries which are participating in the so-called Rammstein format, helping uh, Ukraine uh, at, the, uh, at the moment. Uh, so not speaking about that this war, has already totally redefined the whole East European region, right? uh, totally. So it looks pretty, pretty much like a world war, right? But uh, unfortunately, we don't know at the moment whether what we've experienced during the last half a year was a prelude or a finale, right? And how long this finale is going to take and uh, what it is going to entail. And... Uh, <clears throat> At the same time, paradoxically enough, this, as uh, Moritz already partly mentioned, this war is exactly uh, conducted against the Ukrainian culture as such. Culture, again, being understood here in a very broad sense as a kind of a way of life or um, in ethnographic even, even sense, uh, more than 450 cultural sites and uh, museums have been destroyed in the last half a year by the Russian military. Uh, usually, Russian military is just the avant-garde of the Russian cultural colonialism, which is historically also proven, right? And at the same time, uh, there is a, uh, this war is indeed specific. Uh, if you compare it to other recent uh, and not so much recent conflicts uh, of the last decades, because this war is not just the war between two countries. Right. And this war is not the war between two armies, not only about this. And it's not uh, the war between army and insurgency, right? Uh, this war is actually, that's why it's, uh, I said that it's against the Ukrainian culture as such, that this war is uh, the war of uh, one country's military against the other country's people. And uh, which uh, the people which, uh, were deprived of the right to exist by the aggressor. Right? And perhaps it's also, uh, though this, this idea is pretty also recognizable in the Western context, but it's perhaps also uh, because the West is not so much willing to, uh, uh, to recognize it really, right? but it's basically somehow founded on the premise that uh, mm, on the claim that you don't exist, but since you do exist, but you shouldn't, then you have to be eliminated. Right? So this situation a bit reminds as um, perhaps could be compared to very, very really, unfortunately, to, to what uh, LGBTQ communities are experiencing in some authoritarian regimes, right? Or again, very unfortunately, to the Jewish experience uh, uh, back in the day in the 20th century. Uh, so, uh, in this sense, um, this war is indeed very, very specific, right? But um, uh, going back to the to the title, right, uh, the Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian Revolution, uh, it uh, it has really a very profound meaning, 
uh, and uh, somehow the, the, the most powerful driving force which is behind this war, because what we are dealing with at the moment in the form of war is actually a, what can be called a counter-revolution, right? But uh, which we also know from history that uh, pretty often uh, counter-revolutions uh, did take uh, form of, of different wars, right? So, uh, of course, when I, when I say uh, Ukrainian revolution, I, of course, first of all mean, uh, I mean Maidan, right? Because uh, we, which was uh, somehow the last European revolution so far. Uh, and uh, it's not only the uprising in 2013 and 14, right? But also we can include uh, in here also the so-called Orange Revolution of 2004, uh, which is usually called also in the Western media the first Maidan, Maidan and uh, the the last one is usually referred to as the second, the second one. And uh, as uh, Moritz already mentioned, uh, it's a, it was indeed very much European in a, in a profound sense because uh, Europe uh, uh, in the form of, uh, as we know it, in the form of the EU was somehow very much challenged by this revolutionary claim from the Ukrainian side, right? Because uh, Maidan intention was somehow to drag Europe to its roots. It was basically very much uh, kind of a um, classical, even ancient Greek idea, kind of demos against uh, oligarchos, right? And uh, so in this sense, it also, as it turned out that uh, uh, the European Union uh, was not prepared for such a, for such a challenge, right? Uh, uh, it, it was not prepared that uh, the EU flag uh, uh, could be transformed into a revolutionary flag. And as we know that uh, the EU is rather uh, tending to, to prefer that the EU flag is being burned uh, at the demonstrations, which was usually the case in various European countries then. Uh, to the situation when people would be even dying for for uh, for it, right? And uh, so at the same time, uh, at the same time, uh, Maidan as a Ukrainian phenomenon, uh, which by the way, Maidan itself is a Turkish word, right? Uh, uh, was part of the this global wave of uh, social uprisings and political upheavals. Uh, which started uh, after the economic crisis 2008 and 2011, right? I mean, here the so-called Arab Spring, the Occupy movement in, in the US, Indignados in Europe, uh, and so on. So these square occupation movements, uh, with, uh, which all had uh, this in, uh, emancipative intention to reclaim the agora, right? the political space, uh, uh, by the citizens and for uh, for the citizens, and somehow uh, even from this uh, point of view, we can already judge about the nature of the war because uh, what the Kremlin uh, has been doing is actually the occupation with a reactionary meaning. Right uh, uh, back in the day, people were occupying central squares, uh, demanding more freedom and uh, more rights, and now we have this uh, reactionary or mi military occupation, right? Uh, annexation to kill and to eliminate any kind of possible outcomes of the uh, revolutionary of the revolutionary events, right? At the same time, culturally speaking, Maidan uh, was really a crucial uh, turning point, uh, as it's fashionable to say now, Zeitenwende. <laughs> Uh, uh, point in uh, in the history, not only of the independent Ukraine after the crash of the Soviet Union, but I would even say that uh, Maidan as a political and cultural phenomenon was actually the most, uh, if you analyze it from the point of view of uh, visual culture, right, uh, understood politically, uh, the most powerful image that Ukraine has ever produced in its history, right. Uh, it's uh, if we apply a kind of a political semiology of the image, right, to this revolutionary event, um, um, it, it, be, it becomes clear that uh, uh, indeed in its, in its essence, uh, it was a kind of um, 
ready-made in Marcel Duchamp sense, right? Uh, uh, a kind of a total um, political artistic installation on, in the center of the city, which had been constantly medialized during its development, right? Uh, there is a very beautiful German wor word, which you all know, Gesamtkunstwerk, which depicts uh, really profoundly this, uh, this phenomenon. That's why exactly it was so much fruitful for, for filmmakers, for documentation, right? Uh, meaning all those who had cameras in their, uh, in their hands. And um, that's why it also produced uh, uh, so powerful images like all these Molotov cocktails, uh, firing tires, or barricades. At the same time, uh, Maidan was a very kind of a fruitful uh, playground for uh, various artistic uh, interventions. So uh, in this sense, uh, uh, we can say for sure that because of its visuality, because of the presence of the visual culture, this revolutionary event uh, has succeeded. Right? We, uh, just to make it really short, uh, it was a protest again, an authoritarian, uh, back then pro-Russian president, uh, uh, who was also at the, at the end of the protest already shooting and killing uh, protesters in the center of the city. And then uh, uh, when the protesters took over, he just fled uh, to, uh, to Russia, where he is based uh, at the moment. So uh, I'm just uh, emphasizing this, that, uh, that it's really kind of a visual power of the revolutionary event that uh, made the success uh, actually possible. At the same time, um, artistically speaking, uh, Maidan was a kind of an uh, embodiment of uh, what uh, Josef Beuys used to call social sculpture, right? That you have a context in which, uh, following Beuys' remarks, right, that everybody is an artist, meaning that everybody who took part in it, who brought something to it, right, uh, was contributing to this Gesamtkunstwerk uh, with uh, political, economic, uh, cultural, uh, and so on, uh, dimensions, right, which are, which are really uh, crucial. At the same time, it's really very important if you speak about culture at war, that uh, it was exactly the revolutionary event which gave birth to contemporary Ukrainian culture, right? Without these revolutionary events, uh, Ukrainian culture would be just uh, totally, totally different because uh, it was exactly because of the Maidan revolution that uh, politicality as such started to be really appreciated in the cultural field, uh, being opposite to the tendency to favor like commercial and decorative uh, value of art. Uh, suddenly after the revolution, it turned out that political and artistic developments have a kind of a, uh, the same pacing, right? the same tempo. They, uh, they, they go on parallel uh, orbit and pretty often even on the same one. So uh, only because of the revolution, uh, it became a kind of a consensus uh, in, in Ukraine that uh, art is inseparable uh, from uh, social life, from politics, and can really have effects on social political imagination. Um, we can talk more uh, perhaps in details about this, just not to lose time, but, the, uh, time, but I, would just, uh, um, I would just mention here that uh, it influenced really a lot uh, on the modus operandi of the artistic field. Uh, foremost, uh, um, that after the revolution, it was the idea of collective action in art collective curating, collective organization in, in the, uh, of the artistic processes that became dominant, right? It also had an impact on the media that artists started to use more willingly, uh, putting an emphasis on, on performativity, on poster culture, on, on public actions, on uh, media campaigns, um, on documentary, right? On social critique. These are the accents of this kind of uh, on the intersection of uh, art and act activism, right? That that became uh, indeed dominant because before 2014, 
so-called politicality in art was rather a minor trend, right? Uh, not, uh, not the major one as it uh, appeared to be afterwards. And also because of this revolutionary experience, because politics as such, right, as we know from many, many authors and uh, philosophers, especially from, from the left side of the political spectrum, right, is very much about collectivity and it also uh, was kind of mirrored in the artistic field when artists started to organize themselves, uh, create collectives uh, and uh, act in collective uh, manner constantly afterward. At the same time, politically speaking, um, I am mentioning Maidan and this revolutionary event, not just because it's, uh, we are just somehow fetishizing uh, some grand event uh, in the past, quite the opposite, right? It's Maidan as an experience is not just some distant event, at least from the Ukrainian perspective, right? But, uh, but it's also worth keeping in mind uh, that uh, uh, till, uh, since 2014 till 2022, uh, Ukraine has experienced basically three Maidans, I would say. The one in 2014 uh, was indeed a revolutionary one, right? Uh, the next one in 2019, as, uh, as it was called in Ukraine, but also elsewhere in the media, as far as I was following it, it was called an electoral Maidan. I mean, of course, presidential elections, which brought a person to the presidency, a person we, who managed to, to sustain the country in such a critical moment as on the 24th of, uh, of February, right? And by the way, he came to the presidency opposing uh, the former post-Maidan Poroshenko president right-wing populism tendency, right? It's also worth, uh, worth remembering. And of course, to the, uh, 2022, the 24th of October, which could be, can be called a, a war Maidan, because uh, it was exactly the moment when the whole country somehow uh, reactivated and refreshed its uh, Maidan solidarity experience and became a kind of an um, all Ukraine armed Maidan in a way. Right. Um, we can also talk more uh, afterwards uh, why Maidan as a word and as a phenomenon is so much, uh, so much important. By the way, in the in the uh, last documenta, it was a whole program dedicated to this uh, issue as well. So I'm just saying that uh, uh, because um, uh, it's a constant fear, of course, in in Russia, right? This fear of Maidan, but uh, also elsewhere. Like if you take uh, the Middle Eastern context uh, and uh, and in the U.S. as well, right? All those uh, forces, or be it political and cultural ones which are afraid of revolutions. Uh, so we can say somehow from the uh, today's point of view that, uh, that if you compare the state of things in 2014 and 2022, right? Uh, because in 2014, Maidan was actually uh, people against the state repressive apparatus, right? Which had been seized by a criminal authoritarian bloody leader. And in 2022, we have the situation in which people together with the state apparatus, with the army are opposing the aggression, right? So in eight years, it, it, as, as, we, as we see, it, it, it's been a kind of a really a super profound, a fundamental shift, right? Which also means that revolutions do work, right? They can improve the state. They can improve the state in really in a progressive manner, right? So, uh, so, uh, Ukraine is a kind of a proof, right, that revolution can be a successful remedy against authoritarianism and uh, and um, totalitarianism, right? But of course, this uh, fear of the re of, of revolutions is very much based on the notion of violence, which I also hope we will uh, have some time to talk about, uh, perhaps in the in the discussion. But uh, um, this uh, this revolutionary event is of course crucial uh, in order to understand the, the the nature and the developments of the current uh, warfare because uh, it's basically the uh, very political nature of Putin's regime is of course 
fundamentally counter-revolutionary, right? Not just reactionary, but fund fundamentally counter-revolutionary. Because the main principle, so they can they may claim whatever they want, right? I mean, in the Kremlin. But the main uh, principle, the main purpose of, uh, of this uh, degraded regime is, of course, to uh, create such, circumstance, such circumstances in order to uh, prevent even the precedent of overthrowing the dictator by the people right? as such. That was exactly the reason why uh, all the Russian opposition was, has been smashed right in, uh, at home. That's, that's the reason why Alexei Navalny is in jail. Right? That's the reason behind all the military interventions in various countries, be it Syria, uh, Kyrg Kazakhstan, Belarus, Ukraine, Moldova, and, and so on, right? The, it's really kind of an, uh, not just a personal, but a political obsession with Ukraine from the Kremlin side, right? The, 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 actually, the Kremlin re leader somehow transformed the whole country into anti-Ukraine or anti-Maidan, right? Uh, it's kind of, a, this revolution is a kind of a specter haunting this regime through all throughout the years of uh, of its uh, rule, basically it's because it's uh, Maidan as such and revolutionary event as such is the worst nightmare of this regime. That's why, by the way, in his infamous Crimean speech in 2014 after the uh, occupation of Crimea, annexation is not really a good word because annexation means that it was done once and forever, right? Uh, which is, historically speaking, is not true, right? Uh, but uh, when, when he said that, uh, that when he, in, in which, in this Crimean speech, when he uh, called the October Revolution of 1917, uh, coup d'etat, right? Uh, it, it, because it, it's also very symptomatic that uh, the, the Kremlin regime, in spite of all its claim, claims towards like reconstruction from Soviet Union or whatever, right? Though it's not about any Soviet Union, it's much more about so, uh, um, Russian Empire, right? But it, it, it also has uh, lots of problems with the Soviet heritage because we like it or not, but the Soviet project started with the revolution, right? And that is the biggest problem for uh, for the for the Kremlin as, as such. So uh, this counter-revolutionism, right, is a, indeed a kind of a psychopolitical basis of, the, um, of what we can call today uh, the, Russian, uh, the, Russian state, um, the Russian state fascism. So uh, as for the uh, second uh, concept, right, mentioned in, in the, uh, announced in the, in the title, uh, uh, Moritz also uh, uh, talked about uh, this uh, ideology of uh, Ruski Mir, Russian world, right, which is also part of this uh, state fascist uh, framework that, uh, that uh, the Russian so-called federation uh, currently uh, sticks to. Uh, I, I'm saying uh, so-called federation because uh, Russia uh, in all of its history has never been a federation, right? Has never been a federation. <laughs> it's just, um, it, it has been always about imperial exploitation. It, it, it's just, um, it's just not true, right? As a matter of fact, I mean. Um, so uh, this, uh, this um, uh, Ruski Mir, this Russian world uh, ideology is indeed um, a, a crucial part of this, um, uh, fascist uh, ideological framework that Kremlin is very much sharing and imposing on uh, on others. But uh, the, the best way uh, to understand that uh, uh, would be somehow to uh, to analyze uh, to analyze it uh, from the point of view of um, uh, the best example I can find is basically a, a kind of uh, Lewis Carroll's Alice through the Looking Glass, right? Uh, so uh, all this also what Moritz said about this uh, uh, very specific uh, separate Russian civilization opposed to Europe is basically just a hollow, uh, of course, claim because uh, mm, it, it's, it's very much dependent on Europe and what is going on in Russia, maybe the EU 
doesn't like it very much, but is very much European, is very much European, including fascism it, itself, right? Russian fascism is not a non-European, it's very European fascism. And that's a problem, actually. That's one of the main problems that we are dealing today with. So, the, uh, so this ideology, why is European? Because it's uh, very much dependent and somehow, um, uh, all these problems that Russia, they, they derived from Europe, right? This Russian fascist ideology is, of course, of a very much secondary origin, right? Secondary origin, meaning that it, it functions as a kind of a funhouse uh, mirror of the West, right? Uh, the West uh, um, has the ideology of human rights, right? Russia proposes as an alternative the ideology of Russian speaking compatriots. Right? So uh, the, the West has a NATO military alliance. Uh, the Russian Federation uh, has created uh, I think called, uh, um, collective treaties, collective security treaty organization, right? Which practically means uh, the Russian military and uh, the, the uh, January invasion in, into Kazakhstan was actually conducted by under the under the label of uh, this collective security treaty organization, which was basically the Russian military. It was a kind of a training exercise before. before uh, remember, right? In, at the beginning of January this year, it was a very fast uh, and easy going uh, military invasion into Kazakhstan. Uh, we, like, and, which the Russian military actually killed lots of uh, protesters there, right? In order to suppress the the uprising. Mm, against the authoritarian uh, regime. So, uh, uh, so Russia has been always like presenting itself as a kind of an anti-globalist conservative force, right? Which is still capable of preserving so-called uh, traditional values. In Russian, uh, it's called braces, skrepe, right? In opposition to the decadent West in opposition to the second West. So basically uh, Kremlin tactics in, in this regard is basically somehow mocking the West, like imitating perversely, it's a kind of perverse violent imitation, right? Mocking the West, the European context uh, through fabricating some past grandeur of, of, uh, of Russia, uh, of course, in order to cover up the very peripheral Politically and economically speaking, very peripheral position of, of the of Russia in the in the present, because all these uh, historical lectures that the, the Kremlin leader is so eager to to share with us is of course has nothing to do with uh, with history. It's just a caricature of the past. What can be perhaps called um, kind of a historical thanatology, right? Uh, but at the same time, this war um, uh, and we 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 see it very clearly is a kind of a reenactment, a perversive reenactment of the Second World War, right? Not uh, also not by, uh, not by occasion. For instance, consider the vocabulary of uh, the, the lexicon, right, itself, that, what, uh, that was used to absurdly justify the, the start of this full-scale uh, invasion and uh, the methods that were employed during its conduct, right? This, uh, all this talk about denazification, uh, preventing genocide. Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, um, I, I find it, uh, to be honest, really super problematic because um, maybe it's not very much a lecture format, but uh, to be honest, I really, uh, for me, it's even uh, physically, and I'm really wondering about the German speaking context, right? Especially the German speaking one. Because, I mean, in general, if you consider this in today's uh, world, right? Uh, it's really very even uh, physically very hard to pronounce these words. Isn't it, I mean, strange that uh, uh, fossil fuel oligarch with uh, fascist views is justifying his uh, disgusting crimes with references to the Holocaust? Isn't it absolutely weird and somehow rigged logic there, right? And I'm also, I was also a bit stuck that Again, especially the German uh, kind of uh, speaking world was kind of so eagerly accepted that that it didn't provoke much bigger outrage than it should have been, in my view. I, I find it really a bit 
I find myself in disarray here. I think there is something wrong in in the EU itself, right? The, uh, and because I mean, because this is such an atrocity itself. If you think about this, right? I mean, this the word in itself is a, is already this is atrocity talk, right? And uh, at the same time, these words are out there in the global public sphere, and everybody is referring to them just because also in order to counter them, right? But they are there and somehow already accepted by the general public. Um, yeah, so I, I think it, it's already a, a crime, right? <laughs> to, to a certain extent. Um, but but basically, if you consider this 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 vocabulary, right, you, you can see clearly that it's basically the main Kremlin's ideological distortion, right? To repurpose the discourse which used to, which has to refer to Nazis defeat, to repurpose this Nazis defeat in order to legitimize its own fascist uh, dictatorship, military dictatorship in the present. Right? So this is again, this kind of uh, through the looking glass uh, kind of uh, um, uh, logic. At the same time, there is also a, um, a kind of a, an ideological explanation for that because uh, uh, because it also indicates uh, uh, indeed an ideological weakness of the Kremlin regime, right? Because basically the myth, because why is the Second World War as at all? <laughs> How come that we have to refer to the Second World War conducting this? I mean. Warum, right? <laughs> for, for what reason? But um, again, it, it, it has also kind of a Russian specificity in that because, uh, as I said, about ideological weakness, right? Because actually the, the discourse all about the great patriotic war, uh, which is the term coined by Stalin in order to uh, suppress the Western term of the Second World War, right? Uh, Stalin, by Stalin himself. So this myth or the discourse of the great uh, patriotic war um, is, is actually the only one which survived the crash of the Soviet Union almost without any damages, right? So if you, uh, so, and that's why uh, when, when in, after 1999, when the current Kremlin leader uh, became um, a, a president right of of the russian federation it started to be a kind of an ideological legitimation of the whole regime as such right because it was also very easy not to come to terms with the uh, soviet with the soviet atrocities right because this discourse of the great patriotic war that the war made us the soviets the people right uh, that was a discourse which was basically fencing off the concentration camps, right, in the Soviet Union, and uh, uh, Soviet uh, Soviet repressions, uh, Stalin's repressions, and so on, right, and became an, a kind of an ideological basis for for this um, uh, Kremlin uh, rule. And another part of the problem is, of course, that this uh, contemporary uh, Russian state fa uh, fascism. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, has been also very much domesticated by the West, right? By the Western capital, by the Western politics, uh, to the extent that uh, it was somehow uncomfortable till until recently to publicly denounce it, right? Um, so, uh, so it, it is this kind of inability of the West, right, to to recognize uh, this as uh, as fascism. But uh, I think this is, and also if we, if we also like um, go into the third uh, point of uh, third notion announced in the about decolonization, right? Even decolonization in the title of this uh, of this talk, I think this inability is very much connected to uh, to Europe's own colonialism and the 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 legacy of European colonialism, right? Because if you if you don't recognize uh, the colonial nature of the Nazi war, then, of course, it's very hard to recognize the fascist nature of the new colonial war, which is, I mean, now conducted by, uh, by Russia, right? But at the same time, you have, uh, like, the whole kind of, um, um, the, the, the whole framework here is, uh, is uh, actually played out absolutely according to a kind of a classical textbook uh, that you have a, a, a fascist leader who uh, who publicly and clearly 
lays out uh, his intentions, right? Denying the right to exist of another political group, uh, that this group should not exist, right? And uh, who owns uh, the whole propaganda machine? Well, propaganda is just a soft word, it's just a media, media troops, right? Media war, uh, which, uh, which also is like um, serving this, uh, genocidal purposes, right? And you have, uh, who has also the whole apparatus of the state ready to execute these uh, genocidal uh, fantasies, right? And exterminate in this case, uh, uh, Ukrainians. Uh, so in this sense, uh, I think it's also uh, the problem uh, for not just, the, it's the problem of the West and it's a, a pan-European problem because is basically, uh, I mean, under the guise of the so-called liberal democracy, uh, Western uh, um, political uh, and financial elites uh, have been pumping their assets and capitals into the Kremlin mafia capitalism for years and years, right? Which basically helped to raise uh, this regime. But culturally speaking, just let me make uh, this, uh, this point here. Um, this uh, propaganda machine or, or uh, is it practically means that um, the war machinery is uh, is uh, functioning in absolute fusion with um, with a kind of factory of dreams and enjoyment right with, with the media spectacle staged by, uh, by the Kremlin right so it's like one big uh, mechanism uh, kind of war media, complex, so to say, right? And uh, um, so image production in this complex in, is inseparable from, uh, from uh, the atrocities on, on the ground, right? Um, and this is a very challenging situation for, for cultural practitioners and for artists, right? Because uh, somehow it turned out that, because uh, it turned out that uh, imagery as such, as a field, has been hijacked from from the art field, right? And uh, now, uh, and this uh, this war media complex uh, stays by the Kremlin. Uh, the, uh, uh, it's not just uh, conducting atrocities. It's also it has been producing also a kind of a terrorist visuality, right? Which has to be which has to be countered uh, from the Ukraine side or from the West side, right? But uh, uh, as we as we know also from uh, the ISIS experiences, right, uh, and uh, these uh, public persecutions of artworks, like uh, destruction in the museums, that terrorist logic also produces not only atrocities, right, but terrorists also produce uh, some kind of visuality, a terrorist visuality, and and, and this is the biggest challenge uh, for uh, for artists, right, and uh, that's why basically. Um, if, if we speak uh, about the cultural field uh, at the moment uh, of, of war, right, uh, it, it's mostly, so to say, kind of, a, in terms of art, it, it's very fast reaction, right? It's kind of a fast art, so to say. Uh, it's the first reaction kind of uh, to, to, to the war, right? Uh, because you don't have really a distance in which you can, uh, which art usually or artistic field usually provides you with, right? That you have a kind of a free space for uh, for reflection, for consideration or reconsideration, for proposing an, the alternative and so on. You you are not we are not privileged in this sense, right? Uh, at the moment, it's a kind of a, a very reflexive art, right? Not reflect not reflective, but reflexive. Like uh, which is based on on reflexes, right? Because uh, as as Moritz again mentioned, uh, thank you again, constantly referring to your uh, to to the notes that they made during your speech. Uh, to uh, the, the problem of representation, right? It's uh, it's indeed too early for the proper artistic re representation, which I think is the, the the most important actually problem also at the moment. Uh, also in terms of uh, in in political terms because. Uh, and also in artistic terms, right? Uh, because the representative model is uh, coming into decay in the West, as you know, and so forth, right? And the Italian elections are another proof for that. So in this sense, the, 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 uh, the Ukrainian artists are actually um, acting uh, rather as, as activists, right? On the in intersection of 
activism and journalism, I would say even, right? The uh, uh, archiving, I, I think the, the, the task of, uh, uh, of archiving the situation is, is of profound importance, right? That uh, we will be referring to uh, in the years to come. Uh, uh, so because it's, it's very, because at the moment it's very much about safety, about protection, about displacement, uh, right? About creating new commonalities, uh, about documentation, uh, as it was again mentioned, uh, uh, about uh, also very much about um, uh, uh, about those initiatives who are trying to, uh, to about evacuation, right? Evacuation of art collections, of museum collections. Uh, so uh, I think it's also very important that uh, in the in the context of war, like one of the like possible signs to follow, right, is a kind of a process-based practices. Uh, this is really very fruitful sort of direction to go into because uh, uh, if, you, if you do this jointly in a joint manner, right, uh, it, it could have really, it will have really very, very important uh, uh, outcomes, right? And um, uh, to wrap it up about uh, uh, colonization and decolonization, I think uh, in, in, I already started this, but I think the biggest problem, uh, especially on a pan-European scale, right, is that uh, somehow um, the problem, as I see it at least, uh, is that basically this, uh, because I mean, we just uh, talked this more, is that like today, uh, each, uh, every cultural institution or political institution is doing something on, on decolonization. It's just a fashionable trend, of course, and I mean, we are all involved in this. But at the same time, I think that the biggest problem, at least from, from the, not just Ukrainian perspective, but I would frame it more regionally, right, from the East European rather perspective, uh, because post-Soviet Europe is also part of the Eastern Europe, right? So uh, from from that uh, from this kind of perspective, uh, I think that the problem is that uh, this uh, colonial uh, legacy uh, in Europe has been repressed to the past. So now uh, and very much nationalized. Right? You don't have a discourse of pan-European colonization. The discourse of decolonization is very much nationalized in each European country, right? whether it's France or Germany, or like uh, Great Britain or, and or the Netherlands, Belgium, right, and and, and so on. Like that, that uh, people involved in the process are like trying to uh, go deep into the past, trying to dig dig out something of from from there, right? But at the same time, paradoxically, the the colonial framework uh, is just not implied to the present. Which I, which I find really uh, striking. And uh, so th that in spite of all the claims, uh, the coloniality is just only about the past, being incapable to recognize colonial atrocities just next to their nose, so to say, meaning in, the, in particular in the East uh, of Europe, right? And uh, it also, as for me, explains the uh, kind of inability to think in the colonial terms with regards to uh, to other um, uh, to other countries, right? Because uh, part because perhaps uh, I also think in this sense I think as uh, the uh, Europe as we know it also including those countries which are not part of the union right itself, but at the same time uh, the, the idea of Europe as we know it today, right? It emerged uh, from the outcomes of the Second World War, of, of course. Without the defeat of Nazism, we wouldn't be here, right? I mean, so anti-fascism is a kind of a profound, uh, the foundation, because without that, it's just uh, nothing would be just possible, right? Including pacifism, by the way, right? If Nazis were not defeated, we wouldn't have any pacifism and pacifist claims um, today, right? But I think that uh, in this sense, uh, it was also kind of an uh, self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Uh, uh, or a kind of a trap in the, in the ideological trap, because this never again principle, where is this uh, teaching principle today, right? This never again principle was kind of serving, uh, was so much fetishized, right? That uh, the, the idea of peace in Europe in general, or neutrality or peace, right? Or pacifist claims, they were so much uh, uh, fetishized, right? That uh, somehow that uh, it started to seem that war is uh, uh, impossible just because it's un unimaginable right and uh, as an outcome um, as an outcome the realities of the wars 
on the ground, like for instance, like in Georgia since 2008 and eight, or in Ukraine since 2014, uh, have been just repressed right, from from the surface. And uh, when the repressed returned in, on the 24th of February, uh, Europe was just not prepared to face it, right, to, to tackle to tackle it. And uh, and at the same time, I also think that. Uh, um, that it also has a kind of a colonial uh, background, right? Or, for instance, consider all these, uh, as you know, it uh, um, claims uh, or uh, or uh, the, all these public letters, right, issued by some German figures to, to Olaf Scholz, constantly appealing to stop. Uh, though they are not doing so much, but uh, to stop any kind of uh, uh, armament de deliveries to Ukraine. Uh, it, it's uh, in the in the public discourse, right, it's rationalized under the cover of uh, non-escalation, non -pro not provoking the Kremlin, and, and so on. But at, at the same time, uh, from the uh, if we if we did think post-colonially or in a decolonial manner, right, it's actually very much a, a, a colonial approach or neo-colonial approach, right, because uh, it, it's a typical colonial attitude uh, towards the colonized. Because um, because the colonized are not supposed to defend themselves, also militarily, right? They are not real subjects. They don't have full-fledged agency. It's only the colonizers who have that right to own weaponry, to wage wars. It's not the colonized, not the colonized, right? So I think they're just deprived of this, of this uh, right. And I think th that this West-East divide uh, is still very much uh, present in Europe. And just uh, to be really uh, fast um, in this regard, I think one of the problems is that uh, there has been a kind of uh, uncritical, in my view, at least uh, fetishization of the idea of the global South without really working with it in a more profound manner. And actually, if you consider the political and historical background um, of the Europe's East, especially its uh, post-Soviet part, right? Uh, these experience, historical experiences of the uh, Europe's East complicate a lot this typical dichotomy of the global North and global South, right? And uh, it's somehow it's uh, on the margin. It's not very much recognized because it has been long regarded as a sort of periphery or semi-periphery in Wallerstein's terms, right? Uh, uh, by by uh, uh, by uh, from the side of the Western and Russian metropoles, right? But at the same time, it is exactly this uh, east of Europe uh, which has been experiencing uh, imperial and colonial. Um, occupation for basically for decades, sometimes even for centuries, right? And that is what distinguishes it from uh, many contexts in the global south. Because if you if you consider uh, Ukraine, Moldova, Belarus, Armenia, Georgia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgy Kyrgyzstan, right? The political context and uh, and uh, and uh, anti-colonial uh, practices and struggles of this part of the world, which, by the way, all together make up uh, the biggest part of the European continent. Uh, th they are uh, these deoccupation, so to say, strategies. They are, of course, of, of uh, global uh, importance. And uh, at the same time, these territories throughout the 20th century uh, were in the focus of Western colonial powers, uh, Berlin in, in, in particular, right? Uh, it was uh, these territories, Ukraine uh, foremost in this sense, just because it's the closest one. Uh, it was a direct uh, target of uh, of also Nazi colonial um, practices, right, and uh, and uh, projects. So in this sense, I think that um, uh, if you also uh, like, even after the uh, after the crash of the USSR. Um, uh, the uh, general European approach, uh, approach which was uh, uh, which was shaped uh, uh, on the kind of on the matrix of uh, it was called um, uh, the Eastern Partnership uh, neighborhood, right? Eastern Partnership. It was not uh, it was not considered as uh, our common house, right? Though because uh, Europe has been always. Uh, 
uh, claiming and trying to overcome its historical division and political isolation of its East, right? Uh, actually, it was the main intention behind, behind the uh, 89 revolts, right, in the, in the Eastern and Central Europe. But uh, somehow this, uh, this region was uh, treated uh, as a secondary, as kind of a second-hand Europe. It's again, it's a super typical colonial uh, approach, right? I mean, throughout the whole history, you have uh, um, uh, first-hand Europe, like uh, which is uh, progressive, civilized, right, uh, nicely looking, and you have a second-hand Europe, which is barbaric with uh, some Soviet heritage, uh, like this wild communism in the East, right? It's not really Europe; it's somewhere there, and uh, I think that uh, actually. Uh, this, unfortunately, in my view, this, I think, uh, has made this war possible. Right? This has made this war possible. Because I think the biggest scandal in, in, in just to, to really to finish it, the biggest scandal that, uh, that I mean, even before the 24th of February, right? Somehow, uh, if we'd like step back and uh, try to look from, from, from a distance in a way, that uh, all of the European countries, I, I, I speak here about the European countries because of the uh, Nazi background, of course, right? So all of the European countries somehow in general, in principle, they uh, agreed and accepted in advance that the other European country could be militarily occupied, deprived of its sovereignty, independence, and all of its uh, of all of its institutions, right? And the rest of Europe would get along with it. If you accept such a premise, it will it could have a really a domino effect, right? I mean, I, I think this is really it's not even about only Ukraine, right? I think this is the most dangerous aspect of today's situation that we all in Europe somehow agreed with, with such a fact that this could be possible and also won't, right? Uh, as we know, I mean, I won't go to, into details here, but so in this sense, I think that, um, uh, uh, yeah, so in, in the current situation, uh, the, the, uh, there was a chance in the, in the revolutionary times to get out of this um, um, predicament, uh, through the taking a revolutionary path, right? It was pretty promising for, for Europe as such, but now the only way is uh, through the war, unfortunately, right? It's not just that uh, Ukraine needs it, uh, we don't need it, it was imposed, uh, right? I mean, it's uh, not that something that it's especially Ukraine wants at the moment or demands from the others, right? I mean, in general, if you, if you think about this, this is the only, way the, the only way possible forward is through the war, right? And uh, in order to stop this, uh, I think, of course, uh, this, uh, uh, colonial habits, because this is also a colonial uh, Russian-Ukrainian war, uh, has to be disrupted and defeated uh, internationally in a, of course, in a violent manner, unfortunately, right? Uh, and uh, as we know from uh, just referring to the idea of the revolutionary violence uh, by uh, Walter Benjamin, right, that uh, paraphrasing it, uh, him uh, yeah, one can say that uh, like the, the uh, what defines uh, violence as a revolutionary one is that it's it's been used in proper time and proper place. Uh, so now it's a proper time and Ukraine is a proper place for that. Thank you so much and look forward to the discussion.